I'm here with Dr. Peggy Antrobus, and we were chatting earlier, and she mentioned that she was 40 when she even heard of the term feminism and of this notion of feminism. And that, to me, is very surprising, considering that she is very much a stalwart of the Caribbean women's movement, very instrumental in also making those connections between women's studies in the classroom and also activism, community organizing, and organizing women. So Peggy, if you could take us back to where things How I started. became a feminist. Yes. <laughs> well, it's it's very uh, it's accidental. Except that there are people who say that there's no such thing as an accident. Mm -hmm. I was in Jamaica, but first of all, I had my first encounter with Lucille Mayer mm -hmm. had been as an assistant registrar working on the Mona campus with the registrar Hugh Springer. Um, as the person, the point person on their building program, they they had this incredible building program, but they couldn't spend the money, and every year they had to give it back to colonial development and welfare because if it wasn't spent, it had to go back. And I worked with Hugh just to make sure that the decisions about the building program were taken in a timely fashion so that they could actually get implemented. So Lucille knew me as somebody who could get things done, who could kind of define a job and get it done. I, of course, was a great admirer of Lucille's. And um, she was then warden of Mary Seacole Hall. And uh, in 1974, she had been appointed advisor on women's affairs to the government of Jamaica, a very strong member of the Jamaican PNP, Manly's party. And they were giving her, they were offering her another job, more important job, uh, as the director of their agency for public information. And Lucille needed to find somebody to replace her as this part-time advisor, because it was a part-time job. Um, at that time, I was in the process of registering to do a diploma in education, because I wanted a job that could fit in with being a mother of two children. My daughter was two years at the time, and typically I would just try and get back into the, into the workforce after taking two years off to take care of her. And, um, so there I was, and Lucille said, I want you to do this job. So I said, well, first of all, I don't, I'm not a Jamaican, I'm not a member of the party. This was a very political post. Uh, and I don't know really, I don't have any background in working with women. Uh, my own experience as a woman, I thought at the time, was that I'm fine, you know, I have it all. I never um, experienced discrimination. I did well at school. I won a scholarship. I went to university. I got married. I had children. You know, what's all this about? So, I, and I want a part-time job. That's what I want, <laughs> a part-time job. So I wanted a part-time job. Lucille wanted somebody who'd get things done. And so I took the job. Well, I didn't reckon on feminism because uh, that job just changed my whole life. It changed the way I saw myself, the way I saw the world. Uh, my background was a degree in economics, and um, I had already found out that the economics I learned at university didn't make any sense. So I was kind of really wide open to learning, to learning, and, um, and I think that's, that's how it started. So I took the job, and I started interacting with working class Jamaican women, on the one hand, who held up a mirror to me and I began to see myself differently. I began to see that all these things that were kind of advantages could also be barriers, could also be constraints, you know, the university degree, the marriage, the children, the respectability, the status, middle class, all of these I began to see as I worked with people at mm -hmm. um, that these also constrained me from being free. Well, it's only in retrospect that I, that I put all of that together, but at the time, I was just on this incredible learning curve, not only learning about women, but also learning about myself. Um, so the other group of women that that put me into contact with were people like the Dawn people, uh, what I call the cream of the intellectuals from the South, uh, people like Marie Angelique Savigny from Senegal and Devaki Jane from India, and I was meeting all these incredible women. Uh, people think that I got my feminism from North America. That was not the case. My feminism came from that combination of uh, third world women intellectuals and uh, sister mm -hmm. women. So what was a part-time job became a life's work. 
uh, two years into the Women's Bureau, my husband was appointed to a post in Barbados. So I kind of packed up like a dutiful wife, and I went off to Barbados and thought, well, now I'm going to be a housewife. But before I left, I organized with Sybil Francis at the Social Welfare Training Center a regional workshop um, on the role of women in Caribbean development. And I did that because um, during those two years at the Women's Bureau, of course, the Bureau was started in, on the eve of International Women's Year. And right through 1975, um, I would have the opportunity of going to these regional meetings, these Latin American regional meetings. And of course, the Caribbean was nowhere there. I mean, it's not just the language and the culture, but um, other, the other Caribbean representatives, the other people from the Caribbean who came to those meetings were individuals who came with no kind of background, with no sense of what had been happening before. We were lost. We were a, a set of individuals, two or three or four individuals, who were not together on anything and who didn't know very much about the, about the issues. And so we were kind of floundering. And I thought, you know, we need to develop a Caribbean position on these women's issues to take advantage of the opportunities that were being created by the Decade for Women. So before I left Jamaica with Sybil Francis, who I knew well, she was, in, she was part of the extramural department, um, we organized this regional meeting. Now, the people who, most of the people who came to that meeting were representatives of the Caribbean Women's Association, CARIWA. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of interest, Jocelyn Messiah's mother was the head of Cariwa, Olga Byrne. So we had the meeting, and a number of recommendations came out of that meeting. One of them was that the university should set up a program to, um, to support the work that had to take place in the region to advance the status of women and to increase their participation in development. Um, we had also a recommendation about the CARICOM secretariat, need to set up a women's desk, etc., etc. And then I became the secretary of that steering committee on the eve of my departure for Barbados. Now, uh, in Barbados, uh, while I'm trying to be a, a full-time housewife, you know, and, and, and be a good mother, and et cetera, et cetera, um, I also had the opportunity of going to Boston two or three times a year because uh, I was on the board of the Pathfinder Fund. It was one of those um, uh, population programs and they were trying to build their women's program uh, and I had the opportunity of being on their board and so every time they took me to Boston I then went on to con to New York where I knew I had a very good relationship with the program officer at the Carnegie Corporation of New York and to talk about this the idea of establishing this unit uh, in the University of the West Indies we were very clear that we wanted to go into the extramural department, not into the teaching program or research, anything like that. This was to be an outreach program. I knew the extramural department as a place that, that allowed space for people to create their own interests, uh, that had a presence on all the non-campus countries. Um, and that seemed to be the right place, apart from the fact, of course, that Sybil was a very respected person uh, in that department. Um, at that stage, I didn't have much contact with Rex. But Rex was also the kind of person, it turns out, who was willing to entertain the idea of setting up a women's unit within extramural. Um, so I started talking to Carnegie about funding that. After a year, um, they said, well, you know, who's going to run this program? And I said, well, I don't know. We have a steering committee. And uh, we've, anyway, to cut a long story short, eventually I said, okay, I'm going to do this because I have perhaps the clearest idea of what it is I wanted to do, mm -hmm. which was um, not a clear idea in terms of what exactly what we should do, but I knew that we had to set up a program that was open enough to be defined by women throughout the region. Um, this is how I approached the Women's Bureau thing in Jamaica, knowing nothing about women and not being a researcher. I had started in Jamaica with a series of parish workshops where women in those parishes, working with people from ministries of agriculture and health, the people that were in those communities, to organize these workshops and to, to listen to what women throughout the country were saying about their, their needs. And that's how the Women's Bureau began to develop its thing. So I wanted to do the same thing for the region. 
So we had an objective like to provide technical assistance. Mm. And that is a very open thing, or to raise the awareness. Very broad things like that that then allowed women from St. Vincent, Grenada, Belize, Jamaica to say, this is what we want. Um, we were going along with that. WAND was established. Um, we were doing quite well. Um, funding was easy in those days. Mm -hmm. I was trading on the fact that people knew my work in Jamaica. The Women's Bureau in Jamaica had become very kind of high profile. I never understood why, but people were fascinated by what we were trying to do. That was the context of the decade. You know, within the decade, people were interested in what you were doing. There were resources. I remember talking to the people at Carnegie, and, and they would say, Peggy, just fantasize. You know, what do you want to do? You know, we're here to support you. I mean, I don't know that funders operate that way anymore. <laughs> you know, what it is, tell us what you want to do. <laughs> Kristen had this idea of leadership that was finding people with vision and supporting them. And I learned something about that when I was with WAN, because that's what WAN became, a space where Somebody that had an idea, for instance, there was a young woman who had this idea that she wanted to write this book about women in the Caribbean, about the invisible women, the women that had not, were not high profile women, Nisha Hanif. Mm -hmm. And she wrote this book, Blaze of Fire. I don't know if you've of seen course, it, you know. So, you know. So, Wand gave a space to people like that and supported them. And that was my philosophy in, in, in Wand. Um, anyway, it became obvious that the university needed to have um, a teaching program. I should just go back a little bit and say that uh, without any contact between us, Joss and Messiah had, had started this incredible Women in the Caribbean Research Project coming out of the Institute of Social Economic Studies. Um, I got to know Joss when I went to Barbados, and heaven knows what Joss thought about me. I could just imagine that she thought, who is this upstart? I mean, this woman has no qualifications, you know. In fact, somebody actually called me and said, how come? you're doing this job, a Barbadian, a very well-known Barbadian woman. And um, I said, well, uh, I'm doing this because Wand is actually here because I'm here. <laughs> I said, you know, the program is in Barbados because I happen to be in Barbados. It could be anywhere. It could have been in St. Vincent. Mm -hmm. It could have been in Jamaica. It could have been in Trinidad because that's what extramural allowed for. Um, however, um, I had tremendous regard for Jocelyn. She was actually on the advisory committee for Wand. And I thought, well, I knew that there were people on all the campuses, including the University of Guyana, who were teaching, focusing on women in their teaching. You know, there was Kathleen Drayton in Barbados on in education. There was Susan Craig in Trinidad Sociology. And then I heard about this woman, Rhoda Reddock, who was in The Hague, and who was actually having conversations with the Dutch government about um, funding women's studies programs. So I thought, we have to have a meeting, and WAN could do that. We had the flexibility, we had the resources that we could do whatever we wanted to do, what made sense. I thought it makes sense at the beginning of the 1980s to have a meeting to which we could invite all the women that I knew of who were teaching about women in their courses um, to talk about how we would establish, get the university to create a teaching program of women's studies. And Rhoda was there, of course. I would love to hear Rhoda's story about what she thought of the whole thing, because there she is in, in, in Holland talking about this, and then here's a group of people in the Caribbean who are kind of stealing her idea. I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Well, maybe um, it all just came together it, at the right moment it, for Absolutely, and nothing is by chance. The important thing was that Rhoda had to be at that meeting. That was the important thing. And so we developed a strategy. We decided that we'd start with study groups on the campuses. And there was a campus coordinator. And, uh, and the rest is history. Because, you know, I went on to continue to do the work that I was doing in WAN. That was my thing. It wasn't, I wasn't doing any teaching at the university. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to offer. Um, but I knew that, that the university should be doing something. And building on that amazing research that Jocelyn had done, but also building on the experiences that we were developing in the community. Okay. So what would you say that given your intellectual and political roots as a feminist coming out of work with sistering, work with working women in Jamaica, and also work with feminists from the Global South, intellectuals, activists, what would you say would be your vision for teaching of women's feminist gender studies in the Caribbean 
in the next 20 years. Wow. <laughs> I've been retired from this since 1975. Well, of course, you don't retire from your life, so I'm not retired from this. I'm mm -hmm. retired from being at one, being the coordinator of Dawn. I don't go to these conferences anymore. I'm not a presence on the campuses. I just know that this small beginning of women in development studies have just grown to this incredible institute that is not only teaching, but offering doctorates now. Right and producing amazing young women who, like yourself, who are getting doctorates. And so I, I feel a little kind of hesitant about saying anything about the future. But from my experience, and I would say, I'm saying this now as a feminist, as somebody who is deeply, deeply committed to the work that, the struggle, which continues. I know from my experience with, with Dawn and you do, that the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights is some, an ongoing struggle. You think you achieve something and then everything gets reversed because the politics changes, you know, governments change, people change. Um, so I know it's an ongoing struggle and I would like, to, and I know it's a struggle that requires people of very high intellectual acumen. It, it requires very good research and analysis. It requires um, activists that are committed that I know from dawn that the best possible thing is if you could get academics who are also activists. I know that from not just from dawn, but from people like Rhoda and yourself and you, Dean, and you know the people who were involved in setting up these. That it is not just about you know becoming professors. It's not just about your own career. It, it is also a space in which you could encourage people who want to change if not the world, at least they want to make conditions better for people in our own countries. I mean, I started off, my choice of economics was because I wanted to contribute to Caribbean development. I would, my, my vision is that the University of the West Indies should be about that. And that within the University of the West Indies, gender studies, a very special place because gender studies could do the kind of interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary work that maybe very few other faculties can do. And so I'm always going to want um, the institutes somewhere in the institutes, may not, maybe not everywhere in the institutes, because people have to be allowed to do the things that they want to do, you know, to pursue the, their interests. That's always an important value for me. But somewhere within all of that, there will be people who want to contribute to this larger vision of gender justice in the Caribbean. Um, and there was never a time, there's, well, I shouldn't say there's never been a time. Of course there's been a time when we were still under colonialism and uh, there was, we were still uh, enslaved. Of course, those were the worst of times. There's nothing today that matches that. Mm -hmm. But there, 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 are, there are crises today. There's a crisis of leadership. There's a crisis of not knowing where the Caribbean is going, how we're going to do the things that need to be done. Um, the stuff that... Uh, Alyssa talked about, we have to put it all back in. We have to bring that all back in. I love the way she had that theme. We have to put it all back in. Somewhere in gender studies, we have to put it all back in. There will be individuals on all the campuses who want to put it all back in. And not just in gender studies, because we know that we also have to work with our colleagues in e economics, in political science, in sociology, in medicine, in education all over the place. There will be people who will find each other, nothing's by chance. People will find each other who share that vision of a different world, starting with a different Caribbean, you know? <laughs> and uh, that's, that continues to be my vision. Okay. It's, it's, um, it's where I started in 1950 when I won an Ireland scholarship and went, did economics. I learned very quickly that that economics degree was not going to produce any answers. I learned from feminism that feminism is feminist theory and feminist politics, in fact, is a much more inclusive way of entering to, and changing people's lives. And there are opportunities if you do that kind of research that mm -hmm. starts, that links the macro and the mac micro, that links personal with political, that is holistic, 
economic, cultural, social, uh, etc. That, that that that's where the answers lie. Okay. And what would you say would have been some of the limitations of, of feminist politics in the region? What are some of the things that, looking back, that you think that were either ignored, elated, or that you got wrong, perhaps? Well, a lot wrong, and everything happens at this time. Very broad. I think we never dealt with the issues of class in the way that they could have been dealt with. I think WAND always worked mostly with working class people. We worked with trade unions. We worked with women in communities. Women. We found the knowledge um, in communities from people that had no degrees, not even secondary education, that was more powerful than the knowledge of the university. So, um, but I would agree that our own analysis, after all, I mean, we did our own theorizing and a lot of analysis, but, you know, people have challenged us that we didn't pay enough attention to class, and that may be true. Uh, maybe we didn't pay enough attention to race, and that may be true. So there were a lot of limitations. I mean, I don't think that Wand was, could, could do everything that yeah. needed to be done. Part of the reason I wanted university to have the teaching is because I knew the limitations of land. Um, so uh, as far as the universities being within the university is concerned, my biggest disappointment was that the university, and maybe it was, it, it couldn't be otherwise, I had hoped that the university would look at what land was doing as sites for university research. But I, I realized that um, not only that the timing was wrong, because we were doing stuff long before gender studies or women in development studies was ready to do anything with, with what we were doing. Um, but I realized now that universities have their own um, timetables. You know, research students have a timetable, which is not the timetable of the community. Mm -hmm. You know, so even if somebody is doing research on a community project like the one we did in Rose Hall, the research at best could be non-intrusive. At worst, it could, it could interrupt a process that was a very important to achieving what people in the community wanted to do. So I don't know that universities could actually intervene in that kind of thing. I think they could, they could however. Um, do the research and do the theorizing that we were not able to do and the analysis. So I would still, but of course there's no one anymore. <laughs> and again, the university has evolved. There's now the open campus that, under which all of those units like WAND fit or don't fit. And I think the university's open campus is trying to find a way of how to deal with all of those things. I think the university is struggling on the campus of the gender studies of how do you, how do people who want to be activists, how do they interact? I mean, what, what can you do? I mean, I know you're doing incredible things with using the internet technologies. I know Gabby is doing amazing things. I know that um, while I've been here, people have come up to people like you, Dean and Rhoda and say, you know, you were the person that changed my life. I know that gender studies has that capacity to change people's lives. Um, so I hope that that will continue. But uh, I don't think I have any big disappointments. I'm just mostly grateful for the opportunities I had and for being here at that time that made it possible to do all sorts of amazing things that may not be possible to do now. And in any way, what is required now is something quite different. Okay. Thank you so much, Peggy. Thank you for reflecting with us and also for looking toward the future and bringing that critical eye on the work that you have done with WAN, with IGDS, with gender studies in the university, and keeping those connections between theory, practice, activism, and academia alive and strong. Thank you very much for chatting. And thank you, Tanya, for being you and being here. Thank you.